NLP training workshop. Um, this, um, this meeting, this training seminar will be uh, recorded uh, for your information. <clears throat> and we will, of course, share the recording um, um, with all of you, but also with everyone registered for this workshop. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, John Soldatos from Net Company Intrasoft. I'm a member of the EU IoT project. Um, this is actually a coordination and support action. So um, we uh, offer uh, support activities to the Internet of Things community, notably to the community of Internet of Things projects that are uh, funded by the European Commission, uh, but also to the broader IoT community as part of our support. Uh, we uh, organize a series of um, uh, uh, training workshops. Um, and uh, this is the fifth workshop in a row. They cover um, different uh, edge topics, uh, cutting edge technologies relating to Internet of Things. So just to refresh your memory, to some of you that might have joined more than one, uh, we started with a workshop on Edge AI last May, then we went on uh, uh, having a seminar on the tactile internet, augmented reality, and how it, uh, tactile internet can be combined with IoT. And then we had also workshops for uh, next generation uh, Internet of Things architectures. Today, we are focusing on um, decentralized intelligence with distributed ledger technologies. Um, just for your information, we uh, provide a lot of resources as it do IoT project. Uh, you can find them in the NGIOT uh, Next Generation IoT website. Uh, just go in your browser to uh, ngiot.eu. Uh, there you can find um, many interesting uh, white papers. Recently, we have published um, a report on the status of the IoT open source ecosystem in 2021. It's one report among several. And we have also opened uh, uh, some skill surveys on uh, Internet of Things skills. And we invite you to, to participate on this. As always, publicly share the results not only of the surveys, but of all this research we are doing about IoT skills. Now coming to today's workshop, and um, I'll take a few minutes to introduce what we are discussing today before giving the floor to, to excellent colleagues. So the, today, the theme of today's workshop is um, how we can combine Internet of Things and blockchain technology. And we want to present you a couple of uh, ways and uses of blockchain in Internet of Things applications. But uh, starting from this, we would like to, to, to discuss also with you, also with your engagement in the Q&A and the discussion, some other topics that are touching on the use of blockchain and Internet of Things applications, like when do we need a centralized versus a decentralized architecture in Internet of Things systems? How we can use a blockchain in the edge computing uh, concept? And what, is, what are the trade-offs if you if you just uh, trying to use uh, a blockchain in an Internet of Things uh, system, so on the one hand you gain something like transparency, maybe security, decentralized trust, but how about performance? How about scalability? How about low latency? That might be important concerns in an IoT system. Also, another thing we'd like to touch upon is whether you know, blockchain is something which is maturing enough uh, to be used in an enterprise environment, to be used at scale. And if you want to do this, what kind of blockchain technology or blockchain infrastructure you're using, a public, a private, a permission a blockchain, and so on. Fortunately, we, we, we've got a couple of options here as we are not just discussing about crypto, crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, but about how you can use blockchain in an enterprise application. And there, it makes sense to, to test, to validate other blockchain infrastructures. And I've got this slide just to remind you and to refresh your memory when it's a good idea to use a blockchain in an industrial application. And this is what 
is written on the left of the slide. So when you need a shared database, when you have multiple writers, and these writers do not necessarily trust each other, and there is no easy way to find a trusted third party for uh, validating and managing your transactions like a trusted intermediary, then you've got a window of opportunity for using the blockchain. Of course, if you, if you can work with a centralized architecture and a trusted third party and so on, probably there is no much point in using a blockchain. So having said that, there are some good ideas about using blockchain. We'll see some later on, right? So in the edge computing context, when you have a multi-domain environment and you want to do auditing or management of SLAs, or another very good idea for industrial use cases is when you want to have decentralized um, uh, data provenance and traceability. And there are a couple of uh, interesting use cases for example, I made the list here of what you can find in the literature about uh, manufacturing. So in, indeed, there are there are projects using it for cybersecurity, conformity to, to SLAs, also trusted data exchange in supply chains and value chains, like for example, when you want to share digital product models and uh, um, 3D, 3D printing models for 3D printing, like for example, for additive manufacturing and so on. And another good example is when you really have, you know, a multi-domain a multi -domain case, a case where you have different uh, IoT or edge computing ecosystems and you want to coordinate them. And, you know, those two ecosystems have to work together, like to deliver um, intelligence at the point of action, but at the same time, they don't necessarily trust each other. So maybe that's a good window of opportunity for using uh, um, blockchain technology in conjunction with a, an edge cloud I, IoT uh, system. And as I said, another excellent use case is uh, industrial data because we know that industrial data is are inherently unreliable because of environmental influences, background noise, uh, or you know, also possible uh, cybersecurity threats, cybersecurity attacks, even compromised algorithms. In those cases, there is a good opportunity for using a blockchain system for uh, decentralized uh, data provenance, because we know that as soon as we write some uh, metadata, about your industrial data on the blockchain, uh, then this is almost impossible to be tampered. So it's a good uh, place to have a single version of the, your, of the truth about your data and to be able to look up and understand when, you know, you, there, there might be an effort for hacking or tampering and so on. So that's a very good use case, at least uh, us in, our, in that company, Intersoft, we are using in other projects like Project, Project Star I mentioned here. Now, what blockchain you, you want to use typically in, uh, in uh, Internet of Things context, uh, we want you know, a lot of transactions per second. So typically, you would go for a private or a permission a blockchain, and you cannot afford this computationally expensive uh, proof of work like you would like to go for a proof of stake. So we've run different benchmarks of blockchains. And indeed, with at least with permissions blockchains, you can, you can have some thousands of uh, transactions per second. Again, this is not enough if you think uh, uh, an IoT use case like, for example, connected or autonomous driving, but it's, it's something where you can still start uh, uh, discussing for enterprise deployment, whereas uh, uh, public blockchains used for crypto are probably out of the question. Now, um, having said all this, and after this introduction, this is our agenda from today. I don't want to take more time from our speakers. I just wanted to, to, to introduce the, 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 the theme of um, uh, Internet of Things and uh, blockchain technology. And now, um, uh, I just want to say a few things about our agenda. We've got excellent talks. Um, uh, by four very good speakers from uh, different uh, projects, Terminet, 
uh, uh, IoT engine in Genius and Terminate. And without further ado, I'll, I'll give the floor to uh, your Danish Papuchoglu from, from uh, Sherth um, and Assist IoT uh, project. So, uh, Danish, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, feel free to introduce properly yourself and um, tell us about how you're using blockchain in the Assist IoT project. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, John. Uh, let me share also my screen. I am Jordanis Pavutsoglu. I work uh, in CERF, a Greek institution, and we are part of Assist IoT uh, project. Um, some words for Assist IoT is that it is a European founded project that aims uh, for, to introduce an open and decentralized architecture. In this architecture, we would like to produce uh, human-centric applications. Uh, we have three distinct pilots to test uh, and apply our architecture on. As you and have seen right now, I have not also included blockchain because blockchain would be one component in the whole architecture to build upon. Uh, security is a key aspect in the IoT environment, as everyone knows, since there are different things that we should account, like the large surface of attack, uh, the limited device resources that there is. And only last year, the attacks were doubled. Taxonomies help us to identify are possible uh, points and threats, and one is given by an ESA. Uh, in this taxonomy, there is uh, ab abuse of authorization, uh, where we have uh, incidents like uh, installing uh, uh, software, any device use, or unauthorized uh, data access. Uh, so we aim with uh, to apply DLT and blockchain, uh, especially uh, in the authorization aspect. Authorization is mainly a function to upkeep uh, the security of system, where we apply access control policies and enforce uh, this policy with the attributes that we get. Administration administrators can bundle uh, identical devices and users to groups in order to handle the access rights. Uh, authorization is a good practice for any IoT system. Uh, and it was included in ANISA's good practices during a report. Um, in the authorization part, we have explored the XSML uh, uh, paradigm, it, where uh, Oasis uh, introduced it uh, with the data flow that you see in the screen. Uh, mainly, XSML uh, handles attribute access control, and also, but it can extend to facilitate role-based access control. Um, the standard uh, encourages, and it does not, uh, let's say, guides exactly how you should build. It only encourages different points, uh, like the, uh, uh, the, where it does not specify where the decision is made. So this leaves uh, some room uh, to get uh, from a centralized architecture to a decentralized one. Uh, the idea is to benefit uh, from moving from centralized to decentralized uh, structures uh, because by applying blockchain, we can have immutable data. And when we said data, we basically uh, should think also policies, because that's the uh, great, the vital uh, thing in this architecture. 
we would have a consensus on the blockchain network that will facilitate uh, to have the consistency in throughout our network. Uh, the information basically would be uh, the same in every single device. And by applying, uh, by storing transaction on the public ledger, we can have auditability at any given time. So a shift from a centralized to decentralized uh, architecture can be made for authorization. Mainly we can use uh, an, an architectural environment can look like this, where we have uh, the, uh, the administration point, the information and the decision point outside of a central application into a decentralized network. Um, having the policy as an input uh, along with uh, the information on the blockchain that gives uh, an opportunity for a completely decentralized uh, decision. So we can uh, avoid points of uh, single points of failures. When we have a, a central server, there can be uh, it, it is a point of attack where we can have, uh, let's say, malicious events. So we might have to deal with uh, uh, setting down uh, the procedures that we have on the server. Uh, but this can be avoided on a blockchain network. Why, as long as there is only one node running, we can have uh, the network uh, operate and uh, the application that we have shown is different as uh, John said in his introduction we're not using uh, we're not thinking of using a public blockchain uh, we're we are going to use a permission network um, that the difference is that there is there is no need for have, to have a cryptocurrency so the application, can be deployed almost uh, anywhere. Uh, that's why we are saying it's gen there is general applicability. And also we think that having a permissioned uh, network can help uh, apply blockchain in the real environment where basically you would have entities that want to check their own uh, status of resources at, at any moment. And finally, the greatest thing um, in having uh, is the introduction for the decision to be made uh, decentralized. You're not on an, uh, you're not uh, dependent on a centralized authority and that can uh, be significant. Uh, to have upkeep, uh, upkeep time all the, almost always. Uh, and you can also uh, relieve your central server from getting all the messages. Finally, I, I would like to extend to you uh, assist IoTs and where you can find them. And also um, invite you to, uh, to participate in the open call uh, that is active until 8th of February. Um, all along, I would like to thank, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I am waiting for your questions. Thank you, Jordanis. Are there any questions from many of the, on the speech from uh, any of the of our audience? Uh, please feel free to uh, to take the floor or ask in the chat. In the meantime, what I'm interested in, the Jordanis, about asking is: uh, Do you also use this approach um, in order to uh, have a to, to have a, in a decentralized way to decide it and in, in a decentralized way? the actual policy, the actual uh, authentication and authorization policy, oh. or this is done centrally. So for 
for example, Actually, when there is a new policy, right? So I want to, I, I want to change something on the roles, on the privileges, uh, and so on. Is this a decentralized decision based on the blockchain, or for this, you've got you've got some, you know, uh, central authority that decides the new policy, or you've got some, uh, you know, decentralized consensus, like uh, you know, if I want to um, to, mm -hmm. to to access. Uh, some data and I need a new policy for this, everyone or the majority has to, to approve. So how does how does this work if I really want to uh, to change uh, the authorization and the authentication policy and enforce a new policy in my, my IoT network? So uh, what we have here is basically the second layer in accessing uh, a resource, a device, data, it can be anything. Uh, the first part, as uh, your question implied, is um, on the uh, on the identities part. Identities can be run either centralized or decentralized. Um, this is, uh, let's say, something th th that you can have a centralized um, application uh, that. Uh, uh, the administrator, let's say, can push the policies toward the blockchain. On the other hand, if you apply a decentralized, uh, let's say, identity or um, uh, as it, it, it gets uh, more and more, let's say, uh, prevalent, is to have also the identity in decentralized manner, giving uh, a digital identity, uh an organization a group let's say to the underlying and produce uh, the whole network this can be done um for instance the the one to give uh, the identities let's say to the devices can be the edge and basically you can apply all this on that level even the authorization uh where you run basically the node for your network um so so how many peers do you typically have right if uh if this is a you know multiple well, <laughs> organization you have a peer for each organization or there is another scheme? Mm. this is a question let's say on um let's take it uh, into the bigger picture it would be for every every uh business case or use case uh to go around for instance um, you can have multiple nodes in even one uh, entity uh, we have a for instance we have a construction site uh, construction sites uh, a company may have a uh, couple let's say two or three so you can uh, have a node in every single uh, uh, infrastructure uh, that you have so this is, and there, there, I would say you can have in one entity more nodes. Um, generally, you need uh, to create a network, let's say, with different peers that have different um, uh, agendas, because that's where, uh, let's say, uh, you, for instance, you cannot create a, a health application by having only hospitals to handle um, patients' data. For instance, in that uh, network, you have to keep adding different people so you can have audits. Um, because uh, the administration is the next, uh, let's say, subject in, all, in, in, in the blockchain. Uh, you don't want to have uh, the same people. Um, for instance, as we said, the hospitals can run application on patients' data. So, yeah, who, I agree. You typically have that's typical, right? Yeah. In, who is going you to typically audit have them. in your in your network peers from other stakeholders in the value chain? Exactly. Uh, and these. Uh, um, this this makes sense, you know, also from 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 the business viewpoint, especially if they are stakeholders on, on the data, right? If they are uh, data providers um, and so on. 
Um, yeah, we have yeah one more minute before we go to the meeting. I see a hand from uh, Mr. Berginiadis. Berginiadis, yeah. please. Yeah. Free to, Hello. to ask a question, oh. introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, I hope that you that you can hear me. Uh, thank you for very this well. uh, very nice uh, presentation. Just a short question. Uh, I, I'm I'm interested more in the policy administration point and uh, uh, exactly in your approach. If you could clarify where the ABAC policies are persisted, so if you are using the same um, hyperledger fabric or you are using an external, let's say um, uh, storage medium like IPFS and if this can be modified or updated at runtime. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this would be done, let's say, in the same environment, in a hybrid ledger fabric. Uh, we envision to have uh, administration, ad administrators push their policies. Um, basically, there would be, you know, um, a UI to, um, to not, uh, so the administrator of the system uh, can not only, uh, he should not, let's say, deploy a smart contract. Uh, he is going to define his fields and then the smart contract would be on the hybrid ledger and it would run there. That's why we said it is decentralized um, in the decision policy you have, let's say, two elements, the policy and also the attributes that should go against it to evaluate what, what is happening and if you should uh, give access or not. Um, so yes, it would be on the same hyperledger fabric. Uh, it can extend uh, in, uh, as you said, let's say using I, IPFS systems, uh, but what we are going to explore is having, uh, you know, bundled together in one product um, the, to deploy the policies. Okay, thank you. Yes, I was asking before, because this is something that we are working in ICCS and the separation of concerns actually makes it a little bit uh, more manageable to to accommodate real-time uh, modifications on, on the policy. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for your answer. And because there, let's say there is a drawback, if you have, uh, if you store your policy locally, uh, then how are you, let's say, uh, decentralized? How are you making decentralized the decision? Um, so that's one concern, let's say, in some applications. And, and creating, let's say, middleware to, to deploy the policy in a smart contract uh, can, let's say, abstract uh, the need uh, for administration to know how, how to create a smart contract. Okay, thank you very much, Jordanis, for this presentation and for the discussion after it. I think uh, we can now go to the to the second presentation from uh, IT Engine Project. Dimitri, the floor is yours. Feel free to uh, introduce yourself and your project and uh, give the presentation. Yes, we can see your slides. So. Okay, now it soon will not disappear, so I cannot enable the, <laughs> the video. Let's let's try again. So, uh, and if possible, speak a little bit louder. Yes, thank you, Dimitri. Okay. Now we can see you. Yes. Now let's. Okay, I think this will work better. So, can you speak me? Uh, can you hear me? Well. Yes. Please go on. Okay, so uh, thank you, John. So I'm Dmitry Lagodin from uh, IoT Engine Project. I'm working at Aalto University, Finland. And today I will talk about interledger and self sovereign identities. So uh, first about our IoT Engine Project. 
Uh, the goal there is this to provide interoperability and intelligent edge computing in an IoT domain. So it's a large uh, EU project. We have uh, 19 participants and uh, we research things like IoT meta architecture, 5G communication, federated machine learning, augmented reality, also cybersecurity and privacy. And we have a several living labs where we will then deploy the technologies, including smart cities, smart factories, and, and so on. And as you probably uh, know already well, that the main benefit of distributed ledgers is to provide immutability. And then this in turn would then enable decentralized trust, automation, and interoperability, and many nice things. However, all ledgers have different trade-offs in terms of cost, throughput, security, and privacy. So for example, when we have a public ledger, it's very secure in a way that the immutability guarantee is very high. However, it's also expensive to use, the throughput is limited, the latency is high, and then also uh, there is no privacy since all the transactions are public. And then if you have a private ledger, then it's faster uh, with better privacy and so on, but then uh, a relatively small number of malicious nodes could compromise the security. Uh, so therefore, our approach is that uh, uh, we use multiple ledgers in a single system, which we call in the ledger approach, to combine benefit of uh, different types of ledgers. So this uh, interledger will be the one topic of today's presentation, and then um, another topic will be uh, self-sovereign identities, which means the identities that do not depend on uh, uh, certain third party to issue them, and this would in turn enhance privacy, security, and also a higher degree of automation in the system. So first, I will go uh, through the use cases for Interledger. So the basic, basic idea here is that uh, we can use permissioned ledger for situations when we need to have a high throughput and low cost. And then together we can use a public uh, ledger for high level of trust and immutability, which would then in turn enable much lower cost and better efficiency. This, uh, this approach would also enhance interoperability between the system out and automation because the audit trail will be then stored in the ledgers. And then of course, in some situations, we could even have it to, uh, to private ledgers. So it would be, the solution would be use case specific. And the more concrete use cases of use of interledger is that first, if you have a private uh, data in a, in a private ledger, we can store, we can take a hash over that data and then store that for public ledger for non-repudiation. So instead of like storing everything in public ledger, we just uh, store a hash, for example, for 1,000 or even 1 million uh, private ledger transactions to the public ledger. And in this way, we can provide strong immutability with the uh, low cost. We can also uh, use uh, interledger approach to record access control policies and transactions to various ledgers. Uh, one use case is that we can uh, treat uh, virtual assets in a secure and transparent manner. But for example, in our previous project, we had the case where we have a, a virtual uh, mobile game asset like in-game item. And then there was a one ledger to use the item within the game and another, another ledger was used for trading the item. And the item should be active only in one ledger at, at one time. And then uh, in the cases where we have a large number of uh, collaborating companies, for example, a long supply chain, we could have run a separate consortium ledger, which would store relevant information from private ledgers that, for example, when the, uh, the product is handed over from one transportation company to another or handed over to the warehouse, this information would be then recorded in the consortium ledger and provide a better audit trail and accountability. So the next I will uh, describe our interledger related implementations. So in our previous uh, project called Sofia that ended uh, uh, last year, uh, 
we implemented a single node in the ledger bridge, and there is a link to source code here. And uh, here the idea is that it allows transfer of arbitrary data in an atomic manner between different types of ledgers. It supports uh, ledgers like Ethereum, Hyperledger Fabric, Hyperledger Indie, KSI, and so on, and support for uh, uh, new ledgers is easy to, easy to add. And uh, here the idea is that we have use case specific logic is implemented in a smart contracts that are on the ledger, which then provides a lot of flexibility. So for example, we have a smart contract on initiator uh, ledger, which would emit some event containing the data that needs to be transferred to another ledger. Then the interledger would notice that and uh, read the data and perform transaction to the responder ledger. And then the responder ledger would, uh, the smart contract on, on the responder ledger would then indicate wherever this data has been accepted or there is something wrong. And this information will be then um, also relayed to the initiating ledger. And uh, the system works well and in many use cases. However, since it's a, like a single node implementation, it offers limited performance, security, and resilience. And that's why. In a current IoT engine project, we are developing a decentralized version, which basically allows a consortium of nodes to run this interledger uh, functionality together. And uh, in this way, we can eliminate a single point of trust or failure. And uh, this slide uh, talks in more details about uh, decentralized interledger. So here, the idea is that uh, we are using a, a separate ledger like Ethereum for consortium and state management. So basically when there is incoming transaction from initiating ledger, this information is recorded to this uh, state management ledger and then uh, verified by all the consortium nodes. And then uh, one of the nodes will uh, actually execute the transaction to the responding ledger. And then uh, this transaction will be verified by other nodes and we can configure it to allow K out of head operations, which means that even some nodes don't work or are malicious, the, the system would still work. So basically, all the consortium nodes would be keep track of each other. And in this way, we can avoid the single point of failure and single point of trust. So that was about the, uh, the interledger. So if you want to ask some questions about this, you can ask them now or we. we you can ask at the end of the presentation. Okay, seems there are no questions, then I can go to the uh, second point of today's uh, discussion. The, then we have a concept called self-sovereign identities. And uh, this is the basically a new kind of uh, identity solution. And if we think about the current identifier and certificate solutions, they have several problems. First, we need to have uh, different identifiers for each service, and uh, there is lack of interoperability. Then we have some federated solution that, for example, in Rome that has is used for wireless uh, internet access, but they have only limited use, so it only works in EU in educational institutions and so on. Then we have a social login-based solution, which basically use your Google or Facebook account to access the different websites. But uh, it also has several downsides, like vendor logins. Uh, you must use some. Uh, you, you must have account and some big provider in order to use them. And there, of course, there is a lack of privacy. So if you are using your Google account to access a third-party website, the Google knows that what exactly you are accessing and when. And also, the traditional like X509 certificates are quite inflexible, so they provide a lot of information. So either you reveal all the information or nothing. So the goal of the self-sovereign identities is to uh, provide actual self-sovereignty. So we don't have a reliance on any third party for issuing the identity and also ability to change identifiers at will, which would uh, enable us to use a lot of different identifiers in order to make tracking more difficult and also the ability to disclose minimal amount of information uh, to the service. And uh, on this slide, I will talk about uh, uh, this new self-sovereign 
identifier and credential solutions. So first we have uh, uh, decentralized identifiers called DIDs, which provide self-sovereignty in a way that they, they can be created without dependence on any third party. And uh, they are often derived from public or private key pairs. So basically the data identifier is, uh, is a string that for example, can contain a, a base 64 encoded uh, public key. And then we have a concept of the document objects that uh, provide additional information about the IDs that, for example, how contact the owner and what is the currently used key, if we have a bit more complex DID method and so on. And these DDOs can be stored also on ledgers, but also things like websites, DNS records, and so on. And then, of course, because of GDPR and privacy issues, you should not store a private uh, identifiers of the private people to the ledgers. So the ledgers are suitable only for storing information about public entities like companies and organizations. And then we have a concept called verifiable credentials that allow the subject to prove some claims about itself. So they are similar to authorization certificates, just like more flexible, more designed to be machine readable and so on. And then we have some solutions that support uh, uh, zero knowledge proofs, which means that uh, we can reveal information that is related to the credential without uh, revealing uh, the exact details. That for example, we could reveal that uh, I am over 18 years old without uh, revealing my real age. Because like most of the time when uh, somebody is, wants to check your age, he's interested wherever you are adult or you are above or below certain age, but the actual accurate age is not important. And on the next slide, I will uh, uh, describe how this, uh, this self sovereign identities relate to IoT. So what kind of solution for IoT access control we can build on top of this. Uh, by the way, can you see my mouse? I guess. Uh, no. Okay, so um, in, in the figure, in the lower right of the figure, uh, we have an IoT device that is connected to the lamp that can be read or uh, toggled. And also there is a temperature sensor. And uh, in this uh, scenario, we have a device owner, which is the orange person here. And uh, he will configure the device to trust certain issuers. And the issuers will be then uh, handling the, uh, the user uh, access, user management, and issuers will issue the rights to the users to access the device. And in uh, some uh, simpler use case, the owner and the issuer can be the same person. However, they can be also different ones for additional flexibility. Then, for example, if we have an office building, then we have a uh, owner is the owner of the building. And then in a building, they may operate uh, several companies that lease office space from the owner. And in that case, the issuer would be those tenants who will would like to issue rights for their staff and visitors and, and so on. And uh, then we have a user in the lower left part of the, of the figure. So when user wants to get access to their device, he will um, send an authorization request to the authorization server, which could be a standard or two authorization server run by the issuer. And he would use some means to authenticate the authorization server like password or some token or whatever else. And then as uh, if everything is, is okay, then the authorization server will provide user a verifiable credential, which basically uh, says that the user has access uh, is, uh, has right to access some of the device resources. So in this case, we have a credential mentioned in the uh, uh, top of the figure that uh, uh, says that user has access to this home IoT device one, and he can both read and temper uh, read temperature and light sensors, but he cannot uh, uh, he cannot like actually toggle the light. And then after that. And now that the user has a credential, he can actually contact the device and perform requests to the device to access their resource. 
and he will include the verifiable credential in the, in the request and he will also include this uh, demonstrating proof of possession token which basically will prove the ownership of the private key related to the public key that is mentioned in the credential and then the device will uh, verify the request and if everything is in order both tokens are valid then uh, it will grant the user the access to the, uh, to the device and uh, overall this system is like relatively simple but it has uh, a lot of flexibility and it has important security and privacy advantages that for example here the user can use any number of keys and credentials to access the device user could rotate and change keys very frequently, even use a separate key and credential for each of the request, which means also that the device or the owner of the device will never learn about user's real identity and they can't even correlate the users. So they don't know wherever this uh, user is the same as, as yesterday or wherever it's a, a new person accessing the device. And also here the owner or the device do not need to perform any kind of user management. So the user management will be fully, completely performed by the issuer and the device and the owner don't even know like how many users there are in the system. So this will, uh, this supports the idea that we should disclose only the minimal, minimum amount of information when using the service. So, the only thing the device that the owner need to care is wherever the user is actually uh, authorized by a trusted issue. And uh, we have implemented the proof of concept prototype on a lightweight ESP32 device, uh, device, which can be bought for a couple of euros. And even on that uh, very cheap uh, low power device, the overall uh, credential and token verification takes only 160 milliseconds, which means that the performance is uh, good in, definitely good enough for many of IoT use cases. And in case we have uh, even more constrained device or some old device which cannot uh, do this kind of verifications, we of course can use the proxy in front of the device. So basically then the user will send a request to the proxy which would perform the uh, the verification and then forward the, the request to the actual device if uh, everything is in order. Okay, so I, it seems I'm running out of time. So now it's time for the conclusions. So first about uh, in the ledger that uh, we feel that using multiple ledgers is very beneficial for real world applications since uh, these would allow combining best features of uh, different ledgers in a single system. And uh, the decentralized interledger bridge that we are now currently developing, it allows atomic transactions between different kinds of ledgers in a distributed manner without having a single point of failure. And uh, related to these self-sovereign identities allow very flexible identity management, also in a decentralized manner which then would improve the security and privacy of the user, users and simplify access control management, like I mentioned in a previous slide that the device don't need to care that much about the users. And uh, we can also store identities and credentials of public entities and also things like revocation lists uh, to distributed ledgers. So distributed ledgers can be used for these self-sovereign identities, but it's not compulsory to use them. Okay, so this concludes my presentation. So thank you for your attention and please ask if you have any questions. Now the time to ask any questions, Dimitri. Well, Dimitri, my, my question here is, what are the disadvantages, especially of the, of the interledger approach, right? So I was wondering, isn't that, you know, to, uh, too slow, right? Or probably, you know, less less scalable. So that's, you know, my question about the, the, the interledger. Because, okay, I understand the benefits of the granularity of certificates and so on, but, you know, what, what makes it difficult, right, to use in a, in a real uh, application? That's, that's my, my question. Uh, okay, so, so about, about the interledger, so of course, like the interledger adds some latency, but uh, it's not like significant because we can think about it that interledger is just like a 
uh, application running on some computer. So after we have transaction on one ledger, it will notice that and it perform transaction on a, on a second ledger. And uh, if you think about the system where we have a private and a public ledger, then in practice, in the ledger doesn't add significant extra latency because the public ledgers already have a long latency, like it could be minutes in a Bitcoin or several seconds in Ethereum. So compared to that, the additional latency is, uh, is not significant. We have run some numbers, but it was like re really- Yeah, really well, we, this means that it's already slow, but anyway. Uh, okay. <laughs> got... Yeah, because like the public public ledgers are slow and of course- So it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, that it's already slow. This is what you're what you selling, but okay. Uh, we have also a question, Dimitri, in the, in the chat. I don't know if Loretta wants to, to ask it about the sovereign uh, identities. Uh, I don't know, Loretta, if you want to ask or I can, I can read your, your question. Oh uh, yeah, you can read them. Okay, is, uh, one is in the, in the sovereign identities uh, model, who verifies the verifiers and uh, how is the revocation of uh, uh, certificates uh, handled? Uh, yes, these are, these are very good uh, questions. So mm -hmm. about who verifies the verifiers? So uh, uh, does this refer to the issuer? Or because like here, but the idea is that we have a device that is, has been configured to trust the issuers and then the issuers authorize the users and the device will verify that the credential from the issuer to the user, user is correct. And also this DBOP token is correct. So well, that's, that's why I use the word revocation. Sometimes you can revoke a driver's license or the right to buy alcohol. So uh, how, yeah. how is that handled? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have uh, there's several several options here. That uh, one, of course, is that we could perform online revocation check, and there is also some um, draft solution related to verifiable credentials where we could have a, a re revocation list that can be then queried by the device. Then another solution is that we don't hand, handle revocation, but uh, we can have a, a very short lift certificates because in this in this approach, getting the credentials is is easy and straightforward. So if you have a certificate that or credential which is valid for one day or one hour, then the possibility of misuse is uh, quite low and of course in some case when the device doesn't have an online connection but uh, it, uh, it, it is aware of the time the user could actually very request this kind of revocation list from the authorization server which would prove that his certificate is, on a, is not on a list and he can uh, uh, use this to uh, prove to the device that his certificate is not uh, has not been revoked but of course if you want to have a, like a absolute security then there is no <laughs> no better solution than the online rev revocation check because in other solutions there is still some window of opportunity that uh, the certificate is actually has been revoked uh, did this answer your question yes i i was particularly you know on interested in the decentralized and scalability and so when i see that verification takes only 160 microseconds i think that's very good to have these parameters in uh, but revocation is an important aspect and also as as you mentioned if you can hack a system um, then you know you need to have a decentralized mechanism for avoiding uh, cascading uh, mm -hmm. Yes, any other questions? Good morning. Thank you, Angelina. Yes, please go on. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to ask a question regarding uh, your uh, technology stack related to the, so the, the SSI solution. Are you employing something like uh, Hyperledger, Aries, or have you built something from scratch? over a known protocol or something like this? 
Uh, yes, we, we were considering using some of uh, these uh, hyperledger based uh, SSI solutions, but they seem to be really complex. So mm -hmm. basically, we have implemented our own lightweight solution based on the existing protocols. So uh, like we have uh, verifiable credentials, which are basically the JSON documents, then we can encode verifiable credentials in the JSON web tokens. Also, that would also then contain signatures. And uh, this demonstrating proof of possession token depot, it's also like a draft standard now uh, related to the OAuth 2 work. So basically, we are basing uh, basing the solution on OAuth 2 and, and existing existing protocols and technologies. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, thank you, Dimitri. Maybe it's time to go to the to the next talk. Uh, Carlos and the Genius Project. Carlos, the floor is yours. Please uh, feel free to uh, introduce properly yourself and your project and give your presentation. Uh, hi, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me share first my, my screen. Can you hear me all? Yes, everything is okay. Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos and I am talking to you now about a little bit about the Ingenious project and what we are uh, doing uh, regarding the DLTs technologies. So let me first uh, talk about a little bit about me. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, my name is Carlos Alcaide, a telematic engineer with a Master of Science in Internet of Things, but I'm, I'm also a blockchainer since uh, 2018. And currently I'm working as DevOps engineer in a Telefonica IoT and Big Data in the blockchain team. <clears throat> so first of all, I, I'd like to, to present you uh, the first contact I have with uh, with mm, the problematic we ha uh, of uh, that we can solve uh, we, uh, with Ingenious Project, for example, uh, this is uh, was I, I read this on on a paper <coughs> uh, when I started uh, exploring the, the blockchain world, and this basically uh, is the perfect sample where uh, a symbiosis between IoT and blockchain uh, f uh, fits perfectly. Uh, this is about the, the water crisis in the city of Flint, Michigan, in 2014, uh, where the authorities uh, insisted that for months that the city water was safe to drink. But uh, a CNN article uh, asserted that the Michigan uh, authorities or uh, officials uh, uh, have uh, had altered the samples, the data samples, to lower the city's water lead level. Uh, even a researcher said that uh, if only if the uh, authorities included uh, these two samples in the analytics, the water level, the water lead level, would have been so high that uh, they they would would have been uh, would have uh, the obligation to alert the population and and take uh, some action to to remediate that. And I think this is the perfect example because if these uh, authorities would have uh, have had an IoT system that automatized the the sample collection from the water, and also then after that store the the data in a blockchain uh, network, this, this uh, data would have been uh, immutable and. Mm, there would have been, been uh, any trouble with the with the water. So this is just uh, for settle the, 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 the problematic. So first, I, let me talk about uh, a little bit about the Trustless platform that is the the, product, the blockchain product we have in, in Telefonica and that we are integrating in the into the ingenious project. Uh, I like to say that it is a way of integrating uh, the blockchain technology into any business logic. Uh, basically, 
uh, the trust to S is an intermediate level, uh, <coughs> intermediate layer uh, that uh, between the blockchain technologies and the uh, client systems. Uh, this ledger is uh, deployed on the cloud and makes any client business system independent from the from the difficulties that a uh, distributed ledger technologies involves. <clears throat> uh, it allows to include a uh, powerful uh, tokenization, traceability, and certification tools, uh, all of them based on, on blockchain technologies into any system, just uh, adding in, into the system a few HTTP uh, request uh, uh, to the TrustOS platform. So uh, basically, basically, it allows to interact with uh, this network, for example, Hyperledger Fabric or Hyperledger Vesu uh, or Ethereum by just uh, having no knowledge uh, of, about them. What we get with that is uh, having the confidence uh, of blockchain, uh, of the mutability it it provides. Also, we can eliminate, uh, erase or eliminate the discrepancies between uh, two or more parties, uh, in, for example, in a supply chain scenario. And also, uh, uh, we can minimize the verification cost uh, if any dispute happens between these, these parties. Uh, also, uh, as benefits of Task OS, we can uh, uh, include uh, a blockchain technology into, our, in, into an existing or a pro a product uh, with, without dedicating any time or resource. With uh, the, the existing system doesn't have to uh, make the solution, the blockchain solution from scratch. Is it only have to integrate the the system information system uh, the system information system with uh, with TrustOS, and also with the quality of service that uh, a telco company can uh, pro, uh, can offer. Uh, these just are, these are the the modules we have in in TrustOS, uh, the accessibility module, a tokenization module. Uh, an authentication module, and also we have uh, an identity module for for uh, implementing the decentralized identity, like uh, the uh, uh, project from, from before. Uh, regarding the traceability module, uh, this is the the um, module we are using in in Genius project. Uh, basically, it is about uh, creating digital assets. In, in, in a blockchain network. So you can uh, trace all the activity of, of something on a, a sensor or, a, or some kind of a asset, for example, a cloud, uh, throughout all, all its life cycle. From the moment of its creation, this can record any change in the, in the, in the status of the asset, where it will be a, a status update, like uh, including physical attributes like uh, such as position, temperature, or logical attributes such as the ownership of, the, of this asset, or even the, the controller. Any type of evidence, certification, or valid proof uh, that allows them the control and reliable monitoring of the of the asset and all the of the updates. Uh, so we are creating basically a digital twin in a blockchain network of, of uh, each entity uh, that uh, can be uh, in uh, any process uh, of uh, any of any kind. Then, uh, well, uh, this cross DLT ledger is the uh, the software the the part we, uh, regarding the DLT technologies uh, we are making in Ingenious. Uh, I like to say that it is uh, we are. With this, with the component, this component, we are leaving uh, key information on evidences all over the blockchain networks. And let me explain why I like to say this. Uh, first, uh, we are working with different DLTs. Uh, the guys from Piat, they are working uh, with Bitcoin. In Zenith, they are working with IOTA. 
us and in, in Telefonica and the Fundación Valencia Port, they are working on, on Hyperledger Fabric also. And also, and also we are working with, with Ethereum based uh, blockchain uh, networks. So this is the architecture uh, for the cross DLT layer. We have in the top of the architecture, we have the, the data sources that can be very, uh, um, can vary in the, depending on the kind of sensor or kind of uh, data source that, but all of them goes to the, to the TBL. The TBL means, uh, stands for a data virtualization layer. That is an advanced approach to data integration. The TBL can be considered as an easier way to integrate federate and transform data coming from, dif um, from different uh, data sources into a single and unified real-time environment. And so this DVL is going to send the information coming from the sensors or the events or the, uh, any IoT system to the trusted platform to create digital twins, digital assets. And these digital assets are going uh, from these digital assets, sorry, we are going to create uh, what we called uh, trust points, but that basically, basically is our evidences of this information. And these trust points uh, are going to be uh, saved uh, or stored or sent uh, to different DLTs through all these uh, APIs, these connectors that can connect uh, the trust platform to the Bit a Bitcoin network or a Ethereum based uh, network or or a IOTA network. So let me explain the, uh, the, the concept of, of trust point. Uh, basically, it is an, an evidence of something, but this something are uh, the assets we are creating from that comes from the different uh, data uh, of the IOT systems. So uh, from this data, we are creating an asset. For example, in the first phase, we create the asset with all the, the data that is uh, fixed uh, uh, information, and this, and then the with uh, the uh, 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 with the following updates of this asset, we are modifying the metadata. That is uh, information that can be uh, uh, different from one uh, update from uh, from another. And once we have this, all this information, and in the moment that the user wants, we create a, a trust point. A trust point basically is a, a, a data structure where we uh, use all the trust points and build a maker tree uh, from these assets and store in the trust point uh, the, the hash, the, the hash root of this maker tree. Also the trust point, uh, we build uh, like a blockchain inside the blockchain because we are storing the previous hash of the previous trust point. So in the last trust, uh, trust point, we are uh, pointing to the previous trust to the hash to the of the previous trust point. So this way we can verify uh, from the last to the to the uh, first uh, uh, trust point. Uh, without having to verify each one of them. And once we have the, the, the this uh, evidence uh, coming from the from the digital assets in trust in trust OS, we can register it uh, in different DLTs in Ethereum, in Bitcoin or whatever, using a simple connector that is a simple API, uh, a REST API. And once the Trust point is stored in the in that API. We are going to store the information of the transaction or or whatever in Trust OS. Uh, for for after so after that we can uh, verify the information we have in a normal database or in Trust OS or, or in the DBL against the information stored in the in a public blockchain like Ethereum or Bitcoin. So for example, an information flow. Uh, regarding the, the ingenious project uh, could be a, a maritime port event. Uh, for example, we are working now with the port of Livorno or, or, or the port of Valencia, for example, a Vercel Arriban uh, that 
this triggers uh, a digital asset creation in, in TrustOS. And after that, we can create a trust point, trust point uh, from this digital asset. And once we have the trust point, we can store this uh, evidence in the in different DLTs. Uh, and then, in the moment the user wants, can uh, the user can verify against the the, the DLT if he wants or she wants, uh, uh, comparing information stored in the DPL or TrustOS or any database against the uh, the public blockchain uh, or the IOTA or Hydrolytic Fabric Network. So uh, as uh, some points I'd like to remark is like only key information is, is saved because uh, we are talking about IoT systems and the IoT system or you know uh, produced a lot of information and the uh, DLT is is not a database. We can't store only uh, we can't store all the information we, uh, we want. For example, in Bitcoin we have a limited amount of data that to be stored. Uh, so I. Uh, this is like a, a information verification method. So we have the information, but we want to verify that the information is correct and anyone have modified the information for its own purposes or illegal purposes or, or whatever. So we, we leave a proof, we leave an evidence in, in a certain period of time of, the, of, the, of what information uh, looks, uh, looked like in, in that moment. <clears throat> This is a more uh, ex uh, an example with uh, uh, real data. We have, for example, a, a vessel arrival event in the port of Livorno. Uh, once the, this event happens, it triggers the creation of a digital asset in in TrustOS, like that, uh, and looks like like that. And we, once we have the, the digital asset, with, with digital asset, we can create a trust point that is simple, the asset identifier a timestamp of the moment of creation of the trust point, the Merkel uh, tree root uh, hash, and also the previous uh, hash of the previous trust point. Uh, for example, we have here the two, uh, two examples of transactions. We have made uh, one in the blockchain test network. It's a blockchain Bitcoin test network, and another one in an Ethereum network, a test network in Coban. Uh, both of them saving uh, this uh, this structure in into the blockchain network. So uh, as conclusions, uh, I'd like to say that only key information needs to be safe, not all the information because uh, the DLTs are not a, a data, are, aren't uh, databases. So we created this concept of a uh, trust uh, points to create evidences of the information or or even a lot of uh, information coming from uh, multiple multiple uh, IoT events. Uh, we have the possibility of storing these evidences on any kind of uh, any uh, DLT or uh, that we want. We have Bitcoin, Ethereum, IOTA, and Fabric, but we can add any uh, DLT just creating a connector or an API and adding this inform this uh, connector to the trusted trustless platform. And also uh, that the, this trust point, this evidence this concept, avoids uh, saving uh, large amounts of data in in, in blockchains that can't uh, and where can't where we can't do that. And that's that's all. Uh, if you have any question, I'd be pleased to uh, to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Let's see if we have any questions. Are there any questions? Uh, to Carlos, we are a little bit uh, behind schedule, but still okay. So we can have questions. Are there any questions to, to Carlos? I think there's one question from Hans in the, in the chat, whether the solution is open source, Carlos. Well, uh, trust us as the product uh, is, not open source because it's it's before it's, it comes from before the project the ingenious mm -hmm. project 
and the rest of APIs, we'll, we'll see after the project if we released as an open source code or, or not. So you use the Trust OS it at Telefonica in some project or is still at uh, research? The Trust OS the platform, the Trust OS platform is, like, is a real product in Telefonica that we are using and offering to the clients, mm -hmm. but we uh, improve it in uh, during the project to allow a uh, new new features and new functionalities. So we we added this. Uh, platform to the cross DLT ledger to uh, uh, allow the project to uh, save uh, these evidences into different DLTs using the connectors that the, the partners are implementing. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. Unless we have any other question about Trust OS, I think we can move to the next presentation. Uh, George, again, and Terminate project. So please, please feel free to introduce yourself, introduce your project and give the presentation. The, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Let me share my screen in just a moment. So can everyone see my screen? Yes, George, we can see your screen. Okay. Now you should better see my screen. Perfect. So, uh, hello everyone. This is the last presentation for today. As far as I know, I'm Georgos or George Siahamis. I'm working at CERT, much like Jordanis, who did the first presentation, and I'm part of the Terminate project. And today's presentation will be about auditing and data integrity in IoT installations using DLT. A couple of notes for myself. I don't have a separate slide for this. I'm sorry. I'm 25 years old. I'm um, working uh, since April 2021 here at CERT and since June 2021 I started uh, exploring the blockchain world uh, as part of my work in Terminate project among others. So let's say a few things about Terminate project much like uh, every other project I guess it's an EU funded project. Uh, from Horizon 2020, with its vision being to provide a novel next generation reference architecture based on cutting edge technologies for next generation IoT, while introducing new intelligent IoT devices for low latency market oriented use cases. As you're going to realize very soon, we have uh, quite a lot of use cases and in very different domains. So it's very important to have something really generic, but really applicable to all of those use cases. And our intention is to bring more efficient and accurate decisions to the point of interest to better serve the final user targeting at applying distributed AI at the edge. So far, not much of a DLT technologies um, mentioned in general, but we will get to that very soon, don't worry. And as I mentioned already, we have six different pilot sites to provide proof of work for the project in various domains, such as agriculture, healthcare, smart buildings, supply chain management, VR training, and mixed reality maintenance. So we have quite a variety, as you can see already. Um, a couple of early notes for distributed ledger technology. We have a decentralized database, which is managed by multiple participants across multiple nodes without the central administration. That's the most important part, uh, as you can probably understand, and you know already, I'm pretty sure. Each node has a replica of its database. Uh, the data are stored securely and immutably using cryptographic means such as hashing, as Carlos mentioned, if I reckon correctly. Um, and there is a need for a consensus to update the database. And obviously it's considered a very promising technology not only in IoT installations, but in a lot of uh, areas such as banking, for example, that's a prime example for blockchain because mostly people for DLT and blockchain, which we will get to that very soon. Most people can understand Bitcoin when they think of uh, distributed ledger technologies and blockchain, but it's far the on, it's apart from the only solution that we have. So one, Typical question that I usually stumble upon a lot is DLT equaling blockchain. Well, 
Not really, because a DLP, uh, a blockchain is a type of DLP. So transactions are recorded with a hash in the case of blockchain. There are other DLPs such as has a hash graph, a tangle, and of course, hybrids, obviously. However, you can listen to the term DLP uh, interchangeably with blockchain. So as long as you have the correct context, then it's definitely uh, okay to use it. Um, so why do we use DLT in general? Uh, DLT can bring trust to, the, to a system. So no need for intermediate third parties. So as Mr. Soldatos mentioned in the early stages of this workshop, if uh, it's difficult to find a third party to be a trustworthy, uh, to be the root of trust in that case, then blockchain is a great opportunity for any for a use case. Uh, so basically, I could also add in that case, if the third party solutions are very expensive, then you can definitely consider blockchain as a, a part of your solution. Immutability obviously is a very important, uh, a very important aspect of DLTs that uh, can be exploited in many, many different areas and provide a lot of uh, benefits. And to the two bold, uh, two bolded uh, bullet points, which are the main focus of the DLT solution offered in Terminate project is data security and data integrity and traceability, which provides logging and auditing capabilities to the distributed ledger solutions. And there is also quite a bit of interoperability that can be enforced used uh, DLT and not commercial solutions, which often rely on a specific um, OS such as Windows, for example. And it can lower bureaucratic costs. So that means that uh, transactions are much more efficient and uh, they don't, and as they don't need an intermediary, they can happen directly uh, against the interested parties. So, DLT and IoT is what I like to describe personally as a match made in heaven, because IoT and DLT are both generally new technologies. Not uh, their applications have started quite recently to be exploited in a much more, uh, I would describe it as hectic way. Um, and there is a lot of speculation that uh, DLT can be, can provide the IoT with the next step uh, that it needs, since there is an inherent uh, insecurity in some, uh, and lack of trust in the transactions happening with IoT devices, for example. So it provides an enhanced security and uh, a route of trust among devices, which is absolutely critical for IoT applications. Um, also auditability, as mentioned already, and uh, will be very important thing as we can track data flow and we can see who did what. And that's also a very critical, um, asset to have in IoT installations. And also logging becomes easier and more trusted. It minimizes costs on intermediate trusted third parties and also uh, all those ledger, uh, not le all those things that are written on the ledger, I missed the word, sorry about that, uh, are also time stamped in most of the cases. So uh, logging becomes a lot more easier in that regard. Also, privacy can be enhanced with the use of DLT, so as the personal data can become decentralized. So compromising risks are greatly reduced in that regard. And it's especially important in uh, healthcare projects where in healthcare situations, actually, where patient data are a very, very sensitive thing and you don't want any chance of them being compromised. And lastly, we can see that 
reliability is also one thing as it removes single point of failure for applications. So for example, you don't rely on a single server to uh, have the network and all the applications up uh, as it's decentralized. One would need to compromise a lot of the nodes that are uh, re relevant to the network and data integrity is also safeguarded due to updating via consensus. Uh, as a consensus is much needed to, to create updates and push updates to the ledger, uh, one would need to, uh, to take over, over, let's say, over probably half of the computers or the nodes that are part of a blockchain network if they want to make it unreliable. So we will also, we will now move on to what we will do in the Terminate project as, uh, uh, as part of the secure vertical IoT network. The, our DLT we aims at overall trust increase in the, the usage of a project. So as we have a lot of uh, pilot sites that need to, that will act as a proof of work, we need to make a generic architecture. So uh, trust increase is a key aspect to every of those uh, pilot sites. I'm sorry, I'm losing my words a bit. Um, and we aim it to be versatile enough to handle significantly different use cases. As we mentioned already, we have quite a lot of use cases such as agriculture and uh, healthcare, and all of those have trust as a very, very uh, common parameter that we would like to enhance. We would also aim to provide logging. Uh, before we go to that, I would also like to mention some uh, things about our blockchain solution, how it will look like, uh, if it's going to be mature enough. Uh, it will be based on Hyperledger Fabric. We have seen this uh, technology already a bit. It's going to be a permission network since uh, we aim to have uh, our partners in there. We don't want any public network. So obviously there won't be any cryptocurrency, at least for now, but we will come to that a bit later. Uh, since we aim at using Hyperledger Fabric, it's open source uh, in order to address some questions that have already been asked already. Uh, and we believe that it's a very, very good solution for enterprise and it can also provide us with a lot of uh, flexibility in order to include what uh, is needed for the project, uh, for the for the use case needs, basically. So one thing is logging that we will provide. We will log important data uh, to the ledger, not the entire data stream, but rather a hash. Uh, important data can be considered uh, per use case, but some very generic examples that we can see are intrusion attempts. So when an intrusion attempt happens, we can it will be logged to the blockchain. Or, and uh, it will probably have uh, how it was uh, mitigated and stopped, if it was stopped, obviously. And also another very important thing can be policy changes. So when a policy change happens, uh, it will be written on the ledger and updated to all peers of the network. Another crucial part also, I presume you can not see my mouse currently, Am I right? Yes, we see, we see the slides, right? Yeah, but you cannot see my And my we mouse, see your right? pointer, yes, we see your Oh, mouse. okay, perfect. Because we had that issue with Dimitri, so I presume I would not be able. So perfect. Auditing also uh, is very important, as already mentioned, who did what can be logged onto the network via uh, so since you can see my mouse, I can start with that. This is the rough uh, 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 data flow, let's say, or workflow 
for how the terminate TLT will be working. So uh, an interested person who has the necessary permissions obviously will have a request for log or audit to the smart contracts ecosystem that we will be developing. And uh, depending on what they need, they will hit the appropriate uh, API call, which will be either logging or auditing. So with logging, they can ask to write on the ledger and then they will get back an acknowledgement that the logging of the event has been successful so far. And for the auditing, they will, they will be asking for, uh, for, the, uh, for the point of interest, let's call it here, from the DLT. And then they will get their result back from the smart contract. And then they will be able to see where, who did what or whatever they would like to be uh, cross-checking via the blockchain uh, infrastructure that we will be providing. And lastly, data integrity. Data will be written on an immutable ledger. And which means that, especially in healthcare data, that's probably our favorite use case in that regard, that all the data will not be easy to tamper with. Uh, they will be privately appended and not everyone will have right to see patient data, for example, or private company data in case that they are uh, appended on the ledger. And since we have smart contracts, which is basically the uh, business logic of every use case, every uh, use case will be will have their own smart contracts most likely or the similar smart contracts with some changes depending on the actual needs and limitations that we have because for example hospital data are much more limited to the outer world than any other type of data and we will be using Ricardian smart contracts uh, as well in order to make things much more clear to the common eye. And lastly, I think I'm pretty okay with time, maybe a bit earlier. I got a bit stressed with uh, being a bit uh, behind schedule, so I move. No worries, take your time, take your time. Okay, so some differences with state of the art with, that we can observe is that we are going to be using a permission network, obviously. Hyperledger Public is a permission network. Uh, so we do not intend, for now at least, to include any sort of coin or cryptocurrency that can obviously change. Uh, one important thing to mention here is that Hyperledger Fabric does not have its own coin system, let's say, such as Bitcoin has its own, Ethereum has its own system, but those uh, system, those coins can be created, let's say, with the use of, uh, with using smart contracts. And uh, we will provide a different logging solution rather than the available ones. There are, let's say, some uh, commercially ready uh, logging solutions that definitely cost. Uh, however, we will be aiming to provide a trustworthy and reliable logging solution. Uh, that hopefully can rival the uh, already existing ones. And because of the variety of the use cases, as already mentioned quite a lot, let's say, um, the architecture will be able to fit various environments, hopefully even beyond the six use cases that we're having. And uh, last but not least, uh, those the smart contracts that we will be using will be formally validated uh, with all the partners that are participating in in each use case in order to be uh, as sure as possible that they will be working and suiting their needs. So last but not least, uh, this is the slide of the Terminet partners. That, as you can see, it's quite a big consortium. We have 27 or 26 partners, I'm not very sure. And we would like to thank them all for their contribution so far. So should you have any questions, please let me know.
If not, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Let's uh, see if we have any questions uh, from the audience. Are there any questions? Feel free to uh, write them in the chat. Otherwise, we, we had planned, you know, some buffer time for um, discussion. We are we are just on time with the, with the presentations. We had planned for some buffer time with uh, for for extra discussion. But I think we've we've already had. Uh, uh, this discussion and interesting questions uh, during the presentation. So unless we have any any questions uh, for George, I would like to share some concluding uh, remarks. Uh, this was the, the Internet of Things and Blockchain uh, uh, workshop. I think we've seen uh, um, uh, different use cases and different uses of blockchain IoT environments. And actually, in my personal opinion, what we've seen in the presentations is pretty advanced use of uh, advanced use of uh, distributed ledger technology, right? So we don't, we didn't just show you know uh, some uh, uh, blockchain where you uh, you, you write some data for auditability and so on. I think we, we've seen some pretty advanced topics like the interledger, the sovereign identities, um, you know, the trust OS, uh, and also, you know, this um, uh, last presentation. So um, uh, I would like, unless there are any, any more questions, I think we can conclude here the uh, the workshop. I would uh, I will take the time to uh, remind you what to thank. Thanks, of course, everybody. To thank everybody for connecting today and for the active discussion. Uh, the recordings, the presentations will be available in the NGIOT uh, web web page. But I invite you to visit ngiot.eu because you will find a lot of information there, a lot of, uh, a lot of resources that we, we've uh, planned for you. Uh, so in, in different forms, uh, just, I'm just sharing this slide again. So you will find uh, you know, our white papers, you will find our catalogs where you can look up for IoT training courses, you can look up for IoT open source projects, and we would greatly appreciate if you are in the IoT community, especially to click on the links of the surveys and give us just five minutes of your time to give us your feedback on which IoT skills you consider important for the market today, but also in the future. We are running a, a mega uh, survey, and we are also uh, complementing this with several uh, facts and figures uh, from um, the, the IoT job market, and we will be happy to assemble everything uh, in a nice report, in a nice white paper, and share with you and the IoT community. So that's all for today. Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, uh, this workshop and hope to see you in uh, incoming uh, EUIOT workshops as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Catherine, for I the workshop. You, yeah, I hope, I hope you like this content. I, I think it was really good uh, content and I, I would like also to thank the, the speaker very much for this content and I hope that you all enjoyed this uh, this content as well. <laughs>